So open your Bibles. I know you probably have a copy of God's Word with you. If you do not, there's one there in front of you. Just grab that and turn to the New Testament book of First Timothy. We are really uh, making progress going through the book. We're in chapter 4 now. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we will read our text, verses 1 through 16. So let's stand together out of honor and respect for the precious Word of God. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Though... The insincerity of liars, or through the insincerity of liars, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving for those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, uh, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is a Savior of all people, especially for those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and and your hearers. Father, again, we thank you tremendously for this privilege of gathering and hearing your word, gathering and fellowshipping, and most of all, of worshiping you, for that indeed is a privilege. I pray that we will worship you with clean hands and pure hearts today in Christ, that you'll be with us as we proclaim your word. May it go forth uh, properly with boldness, yet compassion, would you draw people unto yourself, Lord? And would you ultimately take us from where we are to where you would have us to be for our good and for your glory during this time? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're again making our trek through this book. Very, very practical book for preachers, pastors, shepherds, for the church as a whole as well. Probably a very good time for Hampstead Baptist as you're seeking someone to shepherd you, to preach the Word of God consistently to you. And this gives you such practical things in the midst of that search. Who you, um, some qualifications in some areas, some things to be looking for, for the good of the church and of course for the glory of God. So in this, we, we know from... Uh, our time looking at the book, and if you know the book at all, that Paul was an apostle and one sent from God with a message that was the gospel. And he had a dear friend in the ministry, a young man that he was mentoring, and he is sending this young man named Timothy to the city of Ephesus to put in place some things, to shepherd them, to put elders in place, to teach them certain things. Things. So this book and this passage that we read today and proclaim is certainly written specifically to a, an individual, a pastor, but it's also for the entire church as well. So don't zone out on me here at any time. Make sure you understand this is for us some extremely practical things 
for the church as a whole. He speaks both to Timothy and to the church, yet all of it has to do with the gospel and us specifically. So he is indeed speaking to the entire church. He says, Timothy, put these things in place, basically. And church, follow these things. So he says, Timothy, I'm telling you how to do it, what to do. And church, you are to submit and follow these things. And make sure your shepherd does these things. Why? What's the point of it? Of course, it's for the glory of God and our benefit. That's really what everything in Scripture is for the glory of God, for our good as we enjoy God and knowing Him through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he just dives right in with the young pastor Timothy and he says, here's the first thing you are to do. Be ever diligent to detect error in the church. Now, I wish we didn't have to talk about this at all. It would be such a joy just to know that when you come into a, a body of believers, and either as a, a member or as a shepherd, a pastor, or any, in any capacity, that you never have to worry about this thing called false teaching or heresy or anything like that. It would be such a pleasure to come in and just not have to worry about that. But that is not the world that we live in. Never has been, and never will be till we're in the presence of Jesus himself. So it's out there. This idea of false teachings, it's an ever-present thing that we have to be very diligent to detect. Now obviously in the text today, in our reading that we've done thus far and the chapters we have left, Obviously, there were some issues in the church in Ephesus. We're not exactly sure what they were, except for what Paul mentions in the text today, maybe a couple other things. But there were some, some errors that were coming to light, being made known. There were some teachers who were trying to slip some things in that would oppose the apostles' doctrine, that were contrary to the Word of God or contrary to truth. Now, they may have crept in from the temple of Diana that was in Ephesus. Very well could have been. Could have been a multitude of other things. But nonetheless, they were very real. And Paul said, Timothy, you have to watch for them. And you have to teach your people to watch for false teaching. Now, let me say up front. There are some things in Scripture that um, are some, some gray areas, and I think that's by design. I think that's God's providential plan, of course. Some things that we can talk about and debate about, but on the other hand, there are some crystal clear doctrines that are fundamental to our faith. And there's no question there. Those are the things that we absolutely must hold on to, hold tight to, and defend. And this is what Paul was saying. So the culture around Ephesus was continually trying to pervert those things. Ultimately to pervert the gospel. And nothing has changed in our day. We still live in a culture that is trying to pervert the gospel in one way or the other. They try to water it down. They try to change it. They try to make it mean something else to fit whatever uh, their beliefs are, their lifestyles are. And it's an constant thing that we have to be aware of. So if anything is extra biblical, if someone tries to add something to the gospel, to the apostles doctrine, if someone tries to pervert it, if it is extra biblical, then it is error. And ultimately Paul tells Timothy that it is demonic. So you think about this. If the Apostles' Doctrine was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, sent from God, and if they put that in place, and they did, then if it's centered in Christ, if it's the Word of Christ, the Word of God, then it is truth. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So anything outside of the truth can be nothing but demonic, and that is a real Thing. And that is why it's so extremely important to search it out, to be ever aware of it. And when you see it rise up, to take care of it. Look back at the first couple of verses there. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, that's from the time that this was written till the time we see Jesus again, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to, listen how he says it, deceitful spirits and 
teachings of demons. It would behoove us if we would look at it like Paul presented it. Sometimes we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. I don't think anybody wants to do that. Nobody's trying to be mean in the church, you know, in this area. That's not our point at all. But at the same time, if we realize that anything extra biblical or deceitful, um, false teachings, anything outside of the truth of the apostles' doctrine, it's demonic. If it's not truth, then it's the opposite of truth, which is demonic. And we must be aware of it and when it arises to deal with it. It's deceitful and demonic. So again, if it is the opposite of the apostles' teaching, it is demonic. If it has a twist on the apostles' teaching somehow, and that we'll see that a lot, then it is deceitful. Some people are blatantly against the gospel and they just try to obliterate it altogether. But then some are more crafty and deceitful and they'll try to twist it somehow. And you just have to ever be on guard for that kind of thing. So we see clearly in these verses, and the next we'll read verses 3 through 5, that um, when he, he, he begins to talk about some of the things they were dealing with. Look at verse 3 who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good, including those little Reese's cups that I saw this morning in here. If it is received with thanksgiving, and the one I saw receiving it was very thankful for it, I think. Right, Brother Bobby? For it is made holy by the word of God. So, obviously, there was some false teaching going on. And this is how people do. They'll, they'll grab one little area of doctrine somewhere, their little pet doctrine. And they'll begin to build an entire theology around it. And that becomes everything to them. Instead of the gospel itself, there's some little odd little pet doctrine that they adhere to. And this is what was happening here. And Paul told Timothy, look, no, we've already been through that. It's good. All food is good when it's done properly and that type of thing with Thanksgiving. So they are trying to cause division and create a, a fellowship instead, obviously, of a fellowship in Christ. And he said it needs to be dealt with. So whatever it may be. In our day, it's obviously the prosperity gospel. There's uh, legalism that is rampant um, in our culture. Moralism. There is uh, work salvation. There's this new age type of mindset where we are our own deity. And there's a spark of deity within each of us. And all those types of things, they're out there, folks. They're extremely prevalent. So much so that they begin to creep into the church. And I know if you've been in church long, you've seen it. I certainly have where someone will come in and they'll begin to create friends and they'll begin to teach in the church and they sound okay to begin with, but little by little they start saying strange things. Things that if you're in Christ and you know anything about His Word, red flags begin to pop up. And you begin to listen and you'll hear another thing and another and then you ultimately see what is taking place. And Paul is warning Timothy and the church about these things. Why? Because the gospel is precious. We are to hold to the gospel and nothing else. Ultimately, we are to protect the gospel. The church depends on the gospel, folks. It is our sustenance. It is our provision. It is our joy. Ultimately, it's Jesus. And we are to be all about Jesus. Not only does the church need the gospel, but our community needs the gospel. And if we present a false gospel to our community, then there's no hope at all. If we go out of here with a perverted doctrine that someone has been teaching and we share that with a community in order to, to share eternal life with them, then there's no hope in that because there's no hope in anything other than the gospel. And we are to defend it and love it and take great joy in the gospel itself. So while we're here in this spot, let's just pause for a minute and say, how do we do that? 
Well, there's several ways. One is just, and we've heard it already, watch for false teachers. And that's not just me. That's not just your other leaders in the church. It is all of us who are in Christ who are part of this church. Just have an ear open. And you must know the gospel in order to do that. But you have that ear open and the eyes open and you see. So you watch for false teachers. Here's another thing, and I hate to say this, but don't be surprised when you find them. Because they're there. They may not be here at this time, but I promise you, if the Lord lingers, they'll be here. Someone will rise up with a false teaching that will be damaging to the church if we allow them to. We should be saddened by that. That's another thing. Always be saddened when someone is perverting the gospel or bringing in false teachers. It should sadden us, but ultimately we are to deal with it. Now there are various ways to deal with it. Obviously, I think Matthew chapter 18 comes into play. This whole idea of discipline where, um, with the point of restoration. Our point is never to just sever somebody and run them off. That is never the point in church discipline. It's just the opposite. It is restoration. To give them understanding, proper understanding, and bring them back into the fold centered in the gospel. So Paul says just to be ever diligent to watch for error in the church and detect error within the church. So he goes on with this thought. And here's the second thing he says. We should be ever diligent in declaring the truth. So we're, we're to be about detecting error. But what's the best way of knowing how to detect error? To know the truth. When you are saturated with truth, permeated with truth, then anything that is untruth immediately will be clear before you. So he says, Timothy... It is your duty and your job as a preacher, as a pastor, a shepherd, to give truth to your people. Just constantly and consistently flood them, feed them with the truth. Look down at verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers. Now, he says the brothers, he's speaking of the family of God, the church. Specifically there. And he says, if you put these things, what things is he talking about there? We go back to verse 3. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that cannot be created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Again, if you mark in your Bibles, you mark that word, truth. So he says to give people these things. Give them truth. He said, Timothy... You will be a good servant of Jesus Christ when you put these things before the church. These things are the truth. Truths about Christ. Truths about the gospel. He says, let the truth permeate the people. Let them be saturated in the truth. It's like this. We mentioned this recently. Matthew says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In other words, you set people's eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, all other things begin to, to sort in place. It just happens that way. It's pointing people to Jesus. In other words, Timothy, preach Jesus. Just give the people Jesus. Someone once said, Sirs, we must see Jesus. That's what it's all about. Point your people to Jesus. And let's talk about preaching for just a moment. Preaching can be done in many different ways. Many different styles. You all know that. But the ultimate thing that preaching is, is proclamation about the gospel. The gospel is broad, by the way, but it is centered in Christ. Preaching is not conversation. Preaching is not discussion. Preaching is not contemplation. It's none of those things. Preaching is proclamation. There are times for teaching. There are times for discussion and all of that type of thing. But preaching is proclamation. In other words, you take the Word of God and you proclaim it to the people. You say, this is truth. You leave them no doubt in their minds that this is truth. 
And you point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul was saying, this is what you do, Timothy. This is a precious body of people, precious souls. They are to be protected, cared for. And the ultimate way you do that is to preach Jesus to them. And he goes on. He says, just in their minds, they must see Jesus. They must know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. So how are some ways that Timothy were, was supposed to do this? Again, Paul's very specific to this young preacher and telling him how to do it. He doesn't just say do it. He says, here's how you do it. So he, he gave him a quick seminary class, if you will. Look at verse 6 again. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For what? I love this part. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for this life, the present life, and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is a Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So he gives him this list, this real specific list of how to do this, of how to be diligent in declaring the truth. First, he says, know the apostles' doctrine and declare it. And we've spoken a lot about this, that, that God in His providence saw fit to send men, a group of men, and send His truth through those men and set in place a set of doctrines that we are to build as our foundation with Christ being the cornerstone. And he said, that is what you are to proclaim. Proclaim that truth. Don't go outside of that. Don't bring other stuff in. Proclaim the apostles' doctrine. Then he says in verse 7 to avoid false doctrine. That may not seem very primary to us today when we hear that little line there, but it is of the utmost importance because here's what happens. And the way we have things set up in churches today, we'll call a, a preacher in and we'll, we'll provide for him, we'll pay him money so he can live, so he can uh, eat and all of those things. And it used to be where that wasn't quite as much. You know, sometimes it was a chicken on Sunday and that kind of thing or whatever he needed in those areas. I've even been there where the first church I had, my pay more than anything else was what people would leave on the hood of my car when we left on Sundays. That's the truth. But that's changed a lot in recent years. And pastors do, um, churches bless pastors tremendously in our day. And that's a good thing because, you know, we should take care of whoever we have to care for us. But at the same time, it can be dangerous because when we're, we become so used to that income and that um, provision that we could be swayed. Somebody comes to us and says, you know, you were kind of hard on that one thing and I don't think you should do that. Or, or this is how I think you want to proclaim the Word of God and that kind of mindset. And because we don't want to lose our standing and what we have, we begin to back off a little bit. Before you know it, we've watered down the Apostles' doctrine. Happens all the time. And you guys know it does. You've seen it. You've told me you've seen it in other places, in other churches, on television or church you belong to or whatever. It's out there. And we have to avoid that. Ultimately avoiding false doctrine, whatever it takes. Then he says in verse 7, train yourself for godliness. We could really stop right here, folks, because this is the ultimate for a pastor, for a preacher of the word. Nothing Paul could have told Timothy would be any really greater practically than this. Train yourself for Godliness. You have to remember, guys and gals, that preachers are not superhuman. They are very, very human, wrapped in the same flesh that everyone else is. They face great temptation from every angle. 
They are not superhuman. And they need to be godly. Pastors, I remember Robert Murray McShane, great pastor in the 1800s from Scotland. And this quote has just stuck with me ever since I first heard it. My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. That is a great quote. And that is, that's your flock's greatest need is your pastor's personal holiness. I remember a youth pastor that we, at my former church, we were needing someone to help in that area. So we started advertising and seeking someone to come and lead our youth. And we zeroed in on somebody. And so the team gathered with him and I was there with them. And they began to ask them all of these questions, these details and these practical things. And then one of them asked, what is the greatest need in youth ministry today? He said, their greatest need, my youth's greatest need, is my personal holiness. Obviously coming from what McShane said. And that is so very true. It kind of surprised them. They didn't quite know how to act to that and what to say to that. But that's it. And Paul was saying, Timothy, you must be holy. You must be godly. And there are some very practical things of how to do this that the church can help with, with their pastor and with their leaders. One, obviously, is prayer. Folks, you just bathe your pastor in prayer, your leaders in prayer. Anybody that leads and cares and proclaims the Word of God, you pray for them desperately. Desperately. Every believer in this church needs to be praying for your leadership all the time and consistently. There are so many things out there that could knock us down in one way or the other. And the prayers are vital to that. It tells us that in verses 7 and 8. A pastor is to keep focused on God. And we see that in verse 10, I believe. Let's take a look at that again. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So ultimately, be Godward, be God focused. Your entire life is about God. Then he says, Command and teach these things. So proclaim these things. And then look at verse 12 with me. Let no one despise you for your youth. But set, on the, uh, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. In other words, set an example. Be these things. Be focused on God. Be holy. Be godly. So your people can see that and then proclaim those things to them. So truth trumps everything, including age, by the way. Um, this is something very practical for the church. You may have someone to come in here in some uh, setting, some position that's not very seasoned, physically anyhow. Maybe he's fairly young. And that sometimes can be a struggle. I understand life experience is very, uh, a, a good thing. Experience is a very, very good thing. And you just can't, you can't put a price on that really. But ultimately, if that person is speaking truth, that's all you ultimately need. Because it's the Word of God that we need. So if you had a 25-year-old pastor come in here, but he's speaking the truth, then you love him and you pray for him and you listen to what he says and submit to the Word of God. So truth trumps all of that and be an example. So let's take all these things. Again, this is a long passage. It's filled with details, and we could spend much time on it. But here's the big things that I want you to recall. To be diligent in detecting error, false teaching, and to be diligent in declaring the truth. So here's the three things I want us to end on. Number one, this simple. Preach the Word. Folks, again, cannot put enough emphasis on that. You know, there was a time in church history that the preaching of the Word began to take a back seat. Even so much where the pulpit stood. It began to be off to the side. Other things took place of the proclamation of 
the Word. And you cannot let that happen because this is all we really know about our Lord. And we must keep it central and proclaim it to our people. So preach the Word. Here's the second thing. We've mentioned this. Pray for your pastor, your preacher. Pray, 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 pray. You cannot pray enough. And then ultimately, James said this, to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. So you keep preaching foremost in the church. I mean, you do a lot of other things as well, but you have to have preaching so you'll know what else to do. That's got to be there. Then you pray for your preacher of the Word, the one who proclaims the Word. You pray desperately for him and consistently and constantly. But then you do the Word of God, which will give God glory and will do you tremendously well. Amen? Let's pray together.